I can't resist beginning, like any academic, with the past and not the task before me. Uh, David Neal did, I think, a wonderful job of giving you a hint of how much resistance there was to the Brown versus Board of Education decision in this state and across the South, not by simple night riders and, and <coughs> rogues or renegades, but by the people who were the elected officials at every level, local, state, national. There was immense resistance to uh, Brown. And, and uh, indeed, it made all the more heroic the kind of work that Julius Chambers and Adam Stein did, because they did that in the teeth of this fierce resistance. Um, and and uh, it's enormously to their credit that they kept moving. Chambers, as you may have heard otherwise, uh, had a bomb exploded uh, that destroyed their office. They had another bomb exploded near his house. And indeed, he was down, uh, I think, in the eastern part of the state, and his automobile was blown up. Someone later told me that in his low-key manner, he said, a lot of miles in that car, wasn't sure how I was going to get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> I got rid of it. <laughs> but but um, the reason that Swan is so important, uh, from a law professor's point of view, but also from a real-world perspective, has to do in part with what Brown didn't do. Brown, of course, was the foundational case. It said what was wrong. Plessy versus Ferguson had been wrong. Separate is inherently unequal. And in Brown, too, the case that followed a year later, said racial discrimination in public education is unconstitutional. But Brown did surprisingly little to say what was right, what was needed to respond to the challenge that had been made. Indeed, it was hoped, you know, after Brown 1 came down in May of 1954, and they ordered re-argument, that there'd be a clarification of what the duties of every school system would be, that it had segregation. But in a sense, Brown 2 was disappointing, because what Brown 2 did was to say, we're going to send the five cases from Topeka, Kansas, and Clarendon County, South Carolina, and the others back to federal district judges because they're closer to the scene and they will know better than we what needs to be done. Of course, there must be, they said, a prompt and reasonable start, but they didn't say quite what the end was going to be. And candidly, initially, there was so much resistance, as David Neal had said, to the idea of a single black child coming into a white school, that the full scope of where that would go was unclear. And, and I will say that for 10 years thereafter, 10 full years after a 9-0 Supreme Court decision, there was virtually no desegregation at all. In 1964, only 2% of African American kids in the South were in desegregated schools. That is a slow start. The only time the Supreme Court had spoken between Brown II and 1964 was in 1958. And the circumstances in 1958 really gave it no choice because what had happened, as many of you know, is that Little Rock had said, we're going to desegregate simply our high school with the nine most promising African-American kids in the whole system. And when they started to do that, the governor at the time, Orville Faubus, took his National Guard and put them around the school and said, you will not come in. And, and obviously, the challenge there almost couldn't be ignored. So the President of the United States, Dwight Eisenhower, who'd been the Supreme Allied Commander in World War II, commanding the American and the British and the Free French Forces, took the 101st Airborne and said, come to Little Rock, take your bayonets uh, uh, sheaths off. We're going to bring those children into the school. And they did it. And the Supreme Court wrote an opinion <coughs> saying, that's right. We really meant it in 1954. But frankly, they had very little political support. What changed were two things. I think most important what changed is African Americans all across the South begin to realize we've got the court in principle behind us and we've got right on our side. And so here in North Carolina in 1960, in Greensboro, 
the sit-in movement begins, where black students from North Carolina A&T and some white students from UNC Greensboro and, uh, and students from Bennett College, et cetera, begin to go in and challenge the segregation of public facilities in Woolworths and other places. And indeed, in Raleigh, SNCC is created, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating <coughs> Committee, and it begins activity as well. So there's pressure demanding rights with lawyers assisting some of that. And then, frankly, uh, by the early 1960s, uh, John Kennedy, who initially was kind of cool to the idea of moving fast on civil rights, was so moved by the political challenge that Dr. King had created in Birmingham when he had tried to desegregate that city. And by the March on Washington in the summer of 63 that he said, I will sponsor a Civil Rights Act. He was assassinated that fall in, in uh, Dallas. But then the Congress, through the leadership of, uh, surprise leadership of, of President Lyndon Johnson, passed a Civil Rights Act. So finally you don't have the court by itself. You now have the court plus the Congress with a tough act and a president ready to enforce it. And the act not, not simply prohibited uh, 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 discrimination in employment and public accommodations. It said, if you take federal dollars, you cannot discriminate. And if you discriminate, the dollars go away. And then Congress passed a wonderful act in 1965 and put a lot of federal dollars on the table for schools and said, come get them, please. You have any needs in your communities, come get them. But you can't get them if you're discriminating. So the push and the pull, the carrot and the stick, started to have the Supreme Court get back. It found its voice again. And in 1968, as, as uh, uh, Adam said, in a little tiny case involving one of the original Brown defendants, one of the four school districts, uh, state school districts, that was in the Supreme Court at the time of Brown, and here it is 14 years later, and there's still virtually no school desegregation. And so at that point, maybe the second important case after Brown, Green, the court says, we're tired of waiting. You have the obligation to act and act. Now, you must, as, uh, uh, as Adam said, eliminate root and branch segregation among students, among faculty, among administrators and staff, in transportation, in, in uh, extracurriculars, in facilities, in all of the so-called green factors. But gee, strong as that was, as Adam again said, that was a county with a total of 2,400 people, 1,300 students, two schools. Desegregation is pretty darn easy. This is now K-6, this is now 7-12. You go K-6 here, you go 7-12 there, instantly desegregation. What happens when you move to a system like Charlotte Mecklenburg? Charlotte Mecklenburg, for those of you who don't know, is 22 miles across. That's from here to Raleigh. It's 36 miles north to south, 550 square miles, 105 or six schools. How much desegregation you're going to have there? Well, one of the things that made people uneasy, maybe not Chambers and Stein, is that the court had changed composition. Earl Warren, who led the court that decided Brown was now gone, in his place was a moderate conservative Warren Burger, appointed by Nixon, who was widely known not to like busing, won't quote strict constructionist judges. So people held their breath as the case came to the court. But what the Supreme Court did, what they accomplished, was, was astonishing both in principle and in practice. Because they, first of all, said, we've got to clarify what the scope of federal judicial power is to remedy the 14th Amendment violations. Now remember, throughout the South, it was clear there were 14th Amendment violations because all the states had either statutes or constitutional provisions which had prohibited integration. So the, the liability case in every single Southern jurisdiction was easy. You come in and say, you're on it. There's a provision in the state of Arkansas that requires blacks and whites to go to different schools. This is a school district that followed that. Therefore, they have violated the 14th Amendment. I sit down, in effect. It wasn't ever that easy, I know, but that was the issue. <laughs> the conception, but the remedy question, that was the big question. And so what they had managed to accomplish in Charlotte was to ultimately come up with a system, and, and the court said, we know we have to speak on it. The first thing they said is, 
if the school authorities fail in their affirmative obligations, and you proved that they had failed, judicial authority may be invoked, uh, and the scope of a judge's equitable power is broad. How broad? Well, there are four things, basically, that the court underlined in support of Judge McMillan, in support of what uh, Chambers and Stein had done. It said, first, it's OK to start with, in effect, ratios. Uh, Mattenberg had been 71% white, 29% African American. It is OK to start and say, let's look at every single school and see whether it's there. Close. It said, now, that's not the end. That's the beginning. But if the school board hadn't done its job, it's OK for a judge to say, I want every school to look like the community. Second, uh, it, it, it did say, if there's a one-race school somewhere, you had nine out of the 10 intermediate uh, middle schools, which were going to be desegregated. And Judge Mellon said, what about this other one? And I said, oh, we can't make that work. And he said, I don't like to hear that. I want all of those schools to start off desegregated. And third, in relation to that, the reason the elementary schools were so hard is that high schools usually have large populations. Middle schools have slightly smaller populations, but elementary schools have the smallest population. So if there's residential segregation, and there certainly was in Charlotte, it's harder, harder in principle to, to start putting those kids together. And indeed, of the 24,000 African American kids in Charlotte, 21,000 of them were in the central city area. So virtually all of them. And yet you have these places that are 10 or 12 or 14 miles away still in the district, predominantly white. What they held was, we're going to take, as you heard, the white kids here and the black kids here. And for a while, we'll move some of the black kids out. For a while, we'll move some of the white kids in. We're going to have desegregated schools, top to bottom, elementary to high schools. And we're going to use the busing that's required to make that happen. Well, once that had been decided, Judges all over the South looked and said, gosh, I guess there's not very many options here. It's clear. And this is the Burger Court. The conservative Supreme Court is saying, this must happen. Well, what, what kind of difference did it make throughout the South? In 1968, 77% of all black kids were still in schools that were 90 to 100% African American. 77%. In 1972, the year after Swan, it dropped to 24%. Half of all black kids throughout the South were desegregated in one year after, Brown, uh, after, after Swan. And that continued for the next 10 or 15 years. The South became the most desegregated part of the American system. Indeed, at the same time, in, 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 in the righteous Northeast was 51% of African Americans in all black schools. 1976, or in Charlotte, it was 22. And North Central states were the same, only the West was even close. So it was, a, it was a huge change that took place. And actually, in Charlotte, what it led to was the business community, particularly, and the African American community saying, let's make this work. Really in a remarkable way. Uh, C.D. Spangler, the former president of the university system here, fabulously rich guy in Charlotte, said, I want to see this work. And he sent his children to what had been predominantly African American high school, West Charlotte High, as did lots of other people all across the system. And West Charlotte High becomes actually a national model. Still plenty of problems, but actually working well. And indeed, Charlotte actually realized it could take advantage of what it was doing. And after all the resistance you've heard described, it flips and says, we're the city that makes it work. Come do business here. And there's huge in-migration from around the country into Charlotte as one of the credible southern cities that's gotten past Jim Crow. Uh, and, and it works with a slight problem. Uh, the, the, the scholars, there's a wonderful book, by the way, out about the Charlotte system uh, called Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow. Uh, indeed, one of its authors, Amy Nelson, is here and is going to speak to you later. But one of the ironies of what happens in Charlotte is they push the desegregation, is that they start to draw people from Indiana and New Jersey 
who've never been in the situation in which there are racially integrated schools because their systems were set up with very small school districts. Uh, I knew Hartford, and Hartford had 21 school districts within the metropolitan area. So if you didn't want to be with black folks, you went to one of the places that was basically a white district, and they were all stratified. So here's the 190000 to $250,000 neighborhood. Here's the two hundred and fifty dollars to $290,000 neighborhood. You just find the right price range, and you probably price most of the African Americans out, in effect. So they were stunned when they came and found that Charlotte was making desegregated schools work. And not just work because they were integrated. Scores begin to move up. Uh, a lot of the evidence now is that it's not race that made that happen, but socioeconomic integration. That very high poverty schools or very tough environments in which anybody can be educated. Schools with a mix of middle class and lower uh, income children do better. And desegregation made that happen. But for whatever reason, uh, there began to be resistance in Charlotte by many people from the outside who had not gone through the experience of desegregation. And there began to be pushes that said, we've got to do something to change this. As Adam said, the school board had ma maintained, uh, through public elections, support for the desegregation movement right up to the early 1990s. And then in comes a new superintendent with a different idea. And it's John Murphy, and his idea is instead of requiring each of you to have children go to a school that we select, we're going to permit choice. We're going to actually create magnet schools. This is a strong science school. This is a strong math school. This is a strong foreign language school. And let you do some choosing. And we'll have parents, white parents particularly, who feel unhappy about the court-ordered busing. Now I will opt for a school. But we're going to make sure that there's enough control in who comes to them. We're going to create some sort of caps. So we're not going to turn those into all white schools or all African American schools. We'll continue to have some sort of racial balance. Well, it works well for a while. But the plot is thickening. I promise I'm going to be done in about five minutes because I'm going to have time for, for some of your questions. The plot's thickening because the Supreme Court itself has changed composition. Even from the Burger Court, we've gone now to the Rehnquist Court. There's a strong movement in constitutional law and equal protection law of suspicion for race consciousness in public contracting, uh, in, in employment, et cetera. And people are even asking, should there be race consciousness in education? But of course, Swan had said, once you've committed the constitutional violation, it's not only permissible, but actually appropriate to, to be race conscious to overcome the vestiges of prior segregation. Well, the plot thickens, I say, because a, a, a um, transplant from outside the South, William Capiccioni, uh, actually finds that his daughter cannot go to the school she wants to because they've reached a cap in that school, the magnet school, in the number of white kids. And he says, what do you mean, the number of white kids? You're using race consciousness. And the response was, we're in a remedial phase of a desegregation suit. Of course we're being race conscious. Read Swan. His rejoinder was, that's history. You've actually come to a place in which you've done everything needed to fulfill the hopes of Swan to meet the objectives of Brown, and you need to be declared no longer under court order. You need to be declared unitary, a single school district and not two districts. Interesting enough, the school board says, no, we haven't. We still have done things wrong. We've still got things we need to get right. Please let this continue. And the case falls into the hands of a judge about whom Luke Lord Jess is going to tell you since he litigated the case. That as luck would have it, had been a private citizen in the 1970s opposing busing in Charlotte. And he's now the federal district judge. And the case about whether you can continue to have these race conscious uh, devices to bring children together across school lines uh, gets played out in the Belt case, about which you'll hear uh, after, after lunch. So there's a, there's a kind of <laughs> sadness to this. You have this enormous resistance to Brown. You have these brave lawyers and African Americans fighting to make that promise real. You have the breakthrough in Green, and then you have the southern-wide breakthrough in Swan, 
you have desegregation. Oh, by the way, the national government has a national assessment of educational pro pro progress. It is a test they give every two or three years in reading and in math all across the country. You can use those numbers to see whether people are getting better, students are getting better or not. The biggest leaps in NAEP scores came among African American kids in the South after desegregation. Significant jumps, uh, and in some Southern uh, whites as well. So it looked as if desegregation was actually making a measurable, a measurable difference. And then we began to have the question of whether this can constitutionally continue or not. And so, you know, this is meant to keep you all in your seats for the afternoon because the rest of the story, you know, it comes at that point. I'll stop and maybe we should have questions. Thank you.